Okay, so the final speaker of this session is uh, Stephen Jordan from NIST, and he's going to talk about adiabatic optimization versus diffuse Monte Carlo. Okay, thanks. This is joint work with um, uh, Michael Jarrett and Brad Lackey, which we did at our joint center between NIST and UMaryland. Um, and so the topic of uh, this talk is really adiabatic quantum computing, uh, also sometimes called quantum annealing. <coughs> and these are kind of a special purpose type of quantum computer. And the idea is that you start with in the ground state of some simple Hamiltonian, whose ground state is something hopefully easy to prepare, such as a completely unentangled state of n qubits. And then you slowly vary your Hamiltonian in time in a smooth way. And um, until at the end of the uh, time variation, you end up at some other Hamiltonian whose ground state encodes the solution to some computational problem that you want to solve, uh, most frequently an optimization problem. <coughs> And so why is this a model of computation? It's because the adiabatic theorem tells us that if we do this time variation slowly enough and smoothly enough, the system will behave kind of quasi-statically and track the instantaneous ground state of this time varying Hamiltonian. And at the end, you'll have this ground state of this final Hamiltonian, which tells you something. <coughs> and typically, this final Hamiltonian might be something like a classical spin glass model. And why do you want to find ground states of classical spin glass models? Well, one reason is that this problem of finding those ground states is actually NP complete. So one thing that means is that there's a large class of other optimization problems which can all be converted into instances of this. So if you could solve this, you could solve them all. But another thing that this NP completeness means is that um, you don't really expect to ever find a classical or quantum algorithm that can always solve these problems in polynomial time. This would violate some of our uh, views about how we think complexity theory works. But instead, what you might hope for is that you could solve certain classes of these problems, certain special cases, or certain uh, probabilistic ensembles that maybe on average you could solve them uh, exponentially faster than, than brute force. Okay. So what about the performance of these algorithms? To understand that, you need a more um, quantitative version of the adiabatic theorem. So a typical way you might uh, do your time variation is you just linearly interpolate between your initial and final Hamiltonians. So you can think of this parameter s as just some knob you turn. And uh, initially, s is 0, and you slowly increase it to 1. And that brings you from your initial to final Hamiltonian. So just how slowly do you have to turn that knob well, that's ultimately determined by the spectrum of this Hamiltonian. So uh, specifically, there are theorems which tell us that it suffices to take a total time uh, to go from initial to final Hamiltonian, which scales as 1 over the square of the energy gap between the ground and excited state, first excited state. For a long time, this was kind of a folk theorem, but actually now there's rigorous proofs of this. Uh, modulo some log factors, we can basically prove that now. There's a paper from Elgart and Hagedorn does so. OK, so that's the basic setting. And I think there are kind of two really uh, central questions in this whole field of, of quantum adiabatic computing. The first is, fundamentally, how good are these algorithms? Like, suppose we could, you know, suppose maybe you could build a hardware which is very, very good. It does a really ideal job of implementing these algorithms. If you could achieve that, then what could you solve? So that's question number one. What are the ultimate capabilities of these things in principle? And the other big question also is, OK, but what about real life? You know, uh, the hardware that's out there these days, how good is it really? How uh, noisy is too noisy? What happens when you take into account effects of control error and coupling to the environment and so on? And these are both important questions, but I'll, in this talk, I'll only address the first of them, the, the sort of fundamental in principle question. <coughs> And the specific way uh, we're addressing it is we're developing and analyzing classical algorithms for simulating adiabatic quantum computing. <coughs> and so the, the, the basic idea here is that, well, if you could have some classical algorithm that efficiently simulates what these adiabatic quantum computers do, then you wouldn't really need to build them. You could just 
you could just use your classical computer. So we're trying to answer uh, whether that's possible. <coughs> now we can actually not expect to find an efficient classical um, algorithm that simulates all possible adiabatic quantum com computations because there's a, a, a proof which shows that in principle adiabatic quantum computation can implement universal quantum computation. You could, for example, run uh, Shor's algorithm on an adiabatic computer uh, in principle. And so we don't think that classical computers can factor efficiently, for example, and therefore we don't think that classical computers can always uh, in polynomial time simulate adiabatic processes. However, the kinds of Hamiltonians that are used in this universality proof are really quite different from the Hamiltonians that are used in practice for adiabatic quantum computing. And really by in practice I mean both theory and experiment. Like the vast majority of, of both use a, a more specialized class of Hamiltonians and they're being used for optimization problems. And these Hamiltonians are called stochastic Hamiltonians. <coughs> And the definition is that a matrix is stochastic if all of the off-diagonal matrix elements are non-positive. And the reason that that's an important, a noteworthy feature for a Hamiltonian to have is that any stochastic uh, matrix has as its ground state eigenvector something that can be expressed using only real positive amplitudes. That's a consequence of the Perron-Frobenius theorem. And so if you think about that, a, a quantum state without any negative amplitudes in it, it looks kind of classical because it's, it's really a lot like a probability distribution. It's normalized differently. You have the sum of the squares of these things has to be one instead of the sum of them has to be one. But there aren't any minus signs. <coughs> and more concretely, if you, if you talk to like a computational physicist and you ask them, well, do you think you can simulate these kind of systems? A lot of times, uh, this, the um, response you'll get is they say, oh yes, we should have no problem simulating this because there's no sign problem. And so if you're someone who's interested in adiabatic quantum computing, you should you know, take this very seriously. You shouldn't just say, oh, okay, no sign problem and, and go home and continue business as usual. You should be taken aback because if, it's, if, these, uh, if this statement is really true, then that would mean that classical computers can simulate these adiabatic machines and you really don't need to build the, uh, the quantum machine it, for solving uh, computational problems. I mean, that's actually a slight e exaggeration because you could still hope for polynomial speed ups. But if you really did have, you know, if you really were able to take this, uh, you know, rule of thumb from that the, uh, the computational physicist will state to you that, well, it usually works fine if there's no sign problem, if you could tighten that up and actually prove it as a theorem, then it would prove once and for all that stochastic adiabatic computers are fundamentally incapable of exponential speed up over classical computing. So that's something that we should definitely investigate. <coughs> so one of the investigations uh, of this question uh, was done by Matt Hastings in 2013. And so the basic idea here is, well, if you talk to these uh, practitioners of computational physics, you'll find that one of the most popular and uh, successful and widely used methods for simulating um, these kinds of quantum systems is called path integral Monte Carlo. <coughs> and in path integral Monte Carlo, essentially what you do is you have world lines which represent possible histories of your system and you have a stochastic process that you simulate on your classical computer with these world lines sort of randomly wiggle around and you carefully design the parameters of this stochastic process to ensure that these world lines are guaranteed to converge to a probability distribution which mimics the quantum probability distribution. So at the end when you sample the result of your stochastic simulation, you get the same statistics that you would get from your actual quantum uh, measurement. And this normally works very well, especially if there's no sign problem. <coughs> but what Hastings found was that even without the sign problem, it is possible for path integral Monte Carlo to fail in the sense that it will take exponential time to converge even though the original adiabatic process you're simulating is only a polynomial time process with a polynomial gap. And he showed this by constructing some rather weird looking counterexamples uh, where basically what happens is that these world lines kind of get tangled around some obstacles and they cannot converge to the probability distribution that they're supposed to. 
So if you're someone who's in the business of building adiabatic quantum hardware, this is good news. You sort of dodged the bullet. This guy didn't prove that, uh, that your machines are incapable of uh, exponential speed up, and you, know, you can keep trying. <coughs> Um, so this uh, addresses kind of a fundamental uh, question, um, just kind of taking a step back. So where do these stochastic adiabatic computers lie fundamentally in their computational power? And aside from this Hastings paper, there's also some earlier work which uh, I won't get into the details of, but there's complexity theoretic reasons to expect, to, to believe that stochastic adiabatic computers are not capable of universal quantum computation. There, are some, there exist some problems that a universal gate model quantum computer could solve in polynomial time that these machines could not. Um, so there's really two possibilities that remain plausible. One is that these stochastic machines are no more powerful than classical computers in terms of what they can solve in polynomial time. And the other possibility is that they might be sort of intermediate between classical computers and universal quantum computers. And so what Hastings' uh, uh, result shows is that if you want to prove uh, this first one, if you try to take the most obvious proof technique is just you know take these path integral Monte Carlo things and prove rigorous convergence bounds on them, that proof technique cannot work because of these topological obstructions. But the question is still open. Maybe you could try to prove it some other way. And I think the question actually is kind of an interesting fundamental conceptual one because it really gets to the, to the point of what are the ingredients in quantum mechanics, the special features that actually give it exponentially more computational power. There are a lot of things that distinguish quantum mechanics from classical mechanics. There's entanglement, there's uh, superposition over exponentially large state spaces, there are interference effects. And so in stochastic adiabatic computing, you're kind of taking away destructive interference. So you still have entanglement. You still have an superpositions in an exponentially large state space. But somehow there's no destructive interference happening. And so then, it, then you ask, can you still get exponential speed ups computationally? Is interference kind of a necessary ingredient? <coughs> so, so as I said, Hastings' uh, examples take away pathological Monte Carlo as a proof technique for showing that you know, stochastic computers are simulatable, that, in other words, interference is a necessary ingredient for exponential quantum speed up. But what about other proof techniques? So I think the obvious next step is to try diffusion Monte Carlo. I think this is probably the second most popular uh, method amongst practitioners for this kind of problem. And the basic idea in diffusion Monte Carlo, um, you can state it as follows. So, so what is it about quantum systems that makes them hard to simulate on classical computers? Well, one of the things is just the exponentially large state space. If you want to write down the quantum state at a given time on n qubits, that's 2 to the n numbers. And if n is 100, let's say, then there's no computer in the world that can store, that has that much memory. Um, but on the other hand, maybe that's not as um, insurmountable of an obstacle as you might think. Because after all, if you have some probabilistic system, say a system of n coins that are being flipped heads to tails in some stochastic way, that's evolving in some sense a 2 to the n dimensional state space as well. You have to write down 2 to the n different probabilities to specify the state of that system. But you can simulate those things just fine because you don't write down, you don't store the probability distribution in your computer's memory, you just use your pseudo-random numbers and your computer inhabits that uh, probability distribution. So in the case where the ground state of your system is something with all positive amplitudes, something that's proportional to a probability distribution, maybe you just design some stochastic process so that your classical computer inhabits that. And that's the idea of diffusion Monte Carlo. You design some stochastic process that converges hopefully rapidly to this distribution that's proportional to the ground state amplitudes. And so in our work, we kind of took this and we made our simplest, most stripped down, simplified, kind of theorist friendly version of this, uh, which we called substochastic Monte Carlo. And the point of it being to, that maybe if we had a kind of simplified version, we could actually prove convergence and you know, attack uh, adiabatic stochastic computing. <coughs> So what's kind of the essence of this stochastic process? 
basically you have some kind of population of walkers, and it's very much like maybe these little examples of differential equations to model bacterial dynamics that maybe you have in you know, like your undergrad differ differential equations class. You have these walkers that can sort of hop randomly around to nearest neighbors. That gives you a diffusive behavior. But there's also, uh, you know, in your Hamiltonian, there's also some potential. So the diffusion behavior comes kind of from the kinetic term, the hopping term, and then there's a diagonal potential term, which comes from the optimization problem that you're trying to solve. And that's also affecting the dynamics of the walkers in the places where the, the potential is high, then maybe the walkers die off, and in the places where the potential is low, the walkers can reproduce, as if it was some like gradient of food concentration in your Petri dish or something. And so anyway, it turns out that if you choose these um, formulas determining the probabilities uh, for dying off reproduction and diffusing to neighboring sites in just the right way, you can guarantee that the, the um, equilibrium distribution that this stochastic process converges to is exactly proportional to the ground state wave function of your Hamiltonian, which we wrote like this. So here's the probability to be on some bit string x is the amplitude on x, which remember is positive, divided by the sum of all the amplitudes so that this, these probabilities add to one. So that's the essence of diffusion Monte Carlo, and you can see right away that these topological obstructions are going to be completely irrelevant here. They will pose no problem for diffusion Monte Carlo. There's no world lines that you're tracking, and so there's no possibility of them getting tangled around something. So this was our idea that maybe diffusion Monte Carlo would succeed where path integral fails. And another kind of intuition about why um, diffusion Monte Carlo might be a good way of simulating uh, adiabatic optimization is that it exhibits a classical behavior that's fairly analogous to quantum tunneling. People often, when describing the intuition behind why adiabatic quantum optimizers might be good, they say, well, you know, a classical, say, gradient descent algorithm or something might get stuck in a local minimum, but the quantum adiabatic system can tunnel out of these local minima. That's one of the intuitions that's frequently cited. But there's sort of analogous things here in the diffusion Monte Carlo because uh, suppose that um, there's some energy barrier, there's some population on each side, and walkers can um, die off on the wrong side of the barrier and sort of be reborn on the good side of the barrier, and in this way sort of tunnel across it. The height of the barrier then becomes irrelevant to how hard it is to, to uh, traverse it, which is, is somewhat similar to the quantum case. <coughs> And we've done some, you know, computer examples where we can see this kind of phenomenon. Here, the walkers are moving around in, in uh, a space that we can visualize as a line, and there's a, a potential barrier right here. There's a potential slanting downwards, and as we, as time goes on, these walkers diffuse in the right direction and eventually tunnel across the barrier. <coughs> so that's the that's some more intuition, and so you can use these intuitions to motivate kind of like a formal mathematical hypothesis, which would say that diffusion Monte Carlo, maybe our particular theorist-friendly variant, which we called substochastic Monte Carlo, can simulate any stochastic adiabatic process on n qubits in time that's polynomial in n, and also in 1 over the eigenvalue gap of the original process. So that might be your hypothesis. And what do we precisely mean by simulate, we really mean we want to track this probability distribution, which is proportional to the ground state distribution. That's our goal. So is that true? Well, it turns out that that's not true. We were also able to um, construct counterexamples, which are not topological in nature, but instead exploit something else to find examples where adiabatic stochastic optimization works fine, but um, this diffusion Monte Carlo takes exponential time to converge. <coughs> and a rough way of describing how these examples work is that, well, suppose uh, you have some kind of simple barrier system, and when can you classically tunnel across it by this sort of death and rebirth process? Well, you can only tunnel across it if there are already, there's already at least one walker on the right side of the barrier, the place where the energy really is lower. So you say, okay, in the ground state distribution, this one that's uh, proportional to the ground state distribution, if that probability to be on the correct side of the barrier 
is, say, p, then unless you have at least one over order 1 over p walkers, there's not going to be any over there. So that tells you how many walkers you need in order for the tunneling to work. In quantum mechanics, it's a little different. You know, it's, it's really just determined by the wave function itself. There's, there's not this um, denominator here to normalize the, uh, the ground state differently. And so it turns out that in exponentially high dimensional um, vector spaces, this denominator can become exponentially large. These sort of L1 normalized and L2 normalized vectors can look very different from each other. And, or put it differently, the probability distribution that you'd sample from quantumly, the psi squared, is actually very different from this one psi over sum of psi. And so we just constructed some specific examples um, where you can use this difference to make the behavior of the adiabatic and diffusion Monte Carlo processes very different, such that the adiabatic succeeds and the diffusion Monte Carlo fails. And this is actually inspired from also some examples in the Hastings paper. He also sort of pointed out this difference in L1 and L2 normalized vectors uh, for the purpose of analyzing the behavior of uh, open boundary condition path integral Monte Carlo. Uh, but, uh, but we were able to uh, adapt this to diffusion Monte Carlo. So OK, so that tells us that we're not going to get a theorem using um, diffusion Monte Carlo and proving rigorous uh, runtime balance on it that says that stochastic adiabatic computation can always be simulated in polynomial time classically. But OK, our counterexamples and also the ones of Hastings are, are a little bit strange. They don't really look that much like the problems that you typically want to solve in practice. So we thought, all right, let's also try our algorithm. Let's write some code. Let's take some, some kind of problems that you might want to solve in practice and see how well of a job it really does uh, of simulating the adiabatic process applied to those problems. So where did we get our kind of uh, instances to test on? Well, it turns out that there is a very good supply of benchmarking instances for discrete optimization problems uh, coming from the computer science community. And maybe the most thoroughly studied of all discrete optimization problems are SAT and MACSAT. These are, you have some logic formula, and you're trying to satisfy as many clauses as possible. That's the MACSAT version. In SAT, you're trying to solve all of them. And in particular, there's a conference on this every year. There are hundreds of people that go to this conference. And associated with the conference, there's an annual contest where people write software and enter it in and see who, who has the fastest and best uh, max set solvers. And you know, there's even little trophies for the winners of this contest, uh, which I covet, of course. And, uh, and, and so what we did is, is, is we tried our, our simulation of the adiabatic optimization applied to these instances. And what we found actually surprised us quite a lot. It, it turned out that this was, on, even on the first day we tried it, it was looking competitive with the, the world's best SAT solver, the max SAT solvers uh, from the previous year's contest. And we were really taken aback because we weren't ultimately trying to, to do that. We were trying to make a simplified, theorist friendly version of our diffusion al Monte Carlo algorithm to simulate a quantum process. But it turns out that it does such a good job in practice, despite the fact that we can prove that it sometimes fails, uh, that it actually was a competitive. Uh, optimizer for classical problems in its own right. You could even forget about quantum. You could say, all right, this is just a quantum-inspired classical algorithm. <coughs> and so um, what we did is we actually entered it into this year's contest, two, 2016, associated with the conference which was held in Bordeaux this time. And we, we weren't sure what would happen, but we just thought, well, boy, wouldn't it be remarkable if this quantum thing actually which is a pretty general purpose uh, optimizer, actually beats the, the top specialized max set solvers. And so the results are in. Those came in July. We didn't quite achieve that. We did not get the world's fastest SAT solver. But you can see our, our version, substochastic Monte Carlos, right here. And it really did pretty well. So um, basically, the way the contest is scored is that uh, they, they rank the solvers based on what fraction of the instances they solve, and then uh, um, after that, ties are broken based on how much time the solvers use. Each instance, they give you a maximum of five minutes. 
So, um, and in, these, in each row, the, the fastest uh, solver for that category of instances is, is marked in dark green. So our solver was actually quite fast, but it turns out maybe we chose our parameters just a little bit over aggressively and caused us to miss about five of these instances down here, which meant that it was impossible for us to win because some of them got all. So, you know, maybe we're going to try again this year and we'll see if we can uh, fix that problem. <coughs> Any case, here's a little bit more data. Here's, uh, here's the runtime of the different solvers from the contest. Ours is this one in blue, so it's pretty fast. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was pretty interesting to participate in this, this different world, not the, the practical SAT solvers. <coughs> okay, so what's the, the take home message? So, first of all, from Hastings' work and from ours, we know that neither Pathrugal Monte Carlo nor Diffusion Monte Carlo is going to give you a proof that says that um, stochastic adiabatic computers can be simulated efficiently classically with polynomial overhead. So we still don't know the answer to this question. Maybe that maybe this evidence is accumulating to suggest that it really is intermediate power between classical and quantum, but it's it's still very hard to say. And second main conclusion is, on the other hand, in practice, the Fusion Monte Carlo worked very well, both for simulating uh, the the quantum system and also just as an optimization heuristic in its own right. So where does that leave us? Well. We actually have a number, uh, I have a number of ongoing projects in my group about, uh, about sort of follow-up work to this. So first of all, we'd kind of like to map out like, okay, we know on these benchmarking instances it performs well, on this counterexample it performs uh, poorly, but can we kind of like find where the, the border is be between where it w works well and works poorly? And so basically we're trying to take our counterexample and prove it in various ways, make it more physical, more similar to typical um, uh, um, problems faced in practice, in particular involving few, few bit interactions. Secondly, okay, we're trying to improve our algorithm. Uh, enter it in the next year's contest. We've actually found that if we adjust our number of walkers a little bit more systematically, we can do better. And the last one, which is the one that I'm most excited about actually, is to, to continue along this line of work of using ideas from the quantum information community to design new and better classical optimization algorithms, kind of quantum-inspired algorithms. And in particular, there was a paper from the Google group, uh, actually uh, Hartman was uh, one of the authors on this, uh, which showed that you can actually use a control theoretic framework to, to have like a systematic mathematical way of, for thinking about um, adiabatic optimization algorithms and certain generalizations thereof, and how to really choose um, how you vary your parameters in time in your Hamiltonian. And so there's a close relationship between that and classical stochastic algorithms. Basically, it's like if you take Schrodinger's equation in imaginary time, it becomes a diffusion equation, and a lot of the theorems you could prove about one transfer to the other. The same thing applies here, looking at, on the one hand, adiabatic algorithms, and the other hand, uh, stochastic analogs of that, such as simulated annealing. And we've already, this, this point of view applied to classical algorithms has already borne some fruit. We have an unpublished result now which shows that if we apply this control theoretic theorem, Pontryagin's minimum principle, to uh, simulated annealing, it suggests instead of varying the temperature slowly to actually just kind of very violently slam it back and forth between infinite and zero temperature. And if we try that, we can actually get improved performance. So this is kind of applying these ideas that were first proposed in the quantum uh, context to solve some problem in polynomial time, which previously had been a famous example of a problem where um, simulated annealing takes exponential time to converge. So, so that's a very interesting uh, development. I'm not sure where it will go, but uh, I'm excited to find out. And thank you for your attention. Do you have a feeling for how well these counterexamples uh, perform when you have noisy implementations of adiabatic? Anyway? Um, is, there, is there a gap in that case?
I'm not sure. I mean, one problem with these counterexamples is a lot of them involve like many qubit interactions. So they're not really physically realistic in the first place. You couldn't really um, implement them. <coughs> and that's actually the, the, the main thing that we're trying to improve now. We're trying to find a counterexample where adiabatic succeeds, diffusion Monte Carlo fails, and the Hamiltonian only involves few body terms, like say four body or something. Um, I think that's uh, likely to be achievable. But as far as the question of noise, I think it's, uh, it's yeah, that's totally open. I don't have a, a very good sense of that yet. I have a question that might um, be or more comments that might be related uh, to this. By the way, thank you, Stephen, for the very clear talk. Um, so, uh, Vadim Smelyansky in our group, he studied um, the, a prototypical tunneling scenario for a very coherent annealer. Essentially, what he studied is what um, condensed matter people would call an impurity band. So, you have a, a bunch of low lying energy states, all at the same energy. And the rest of the states have higher up energy, let's assume, also all the same. Then you start your system being sort of stuck in a local minimum, quote unquote, in one of those impurity states. And then he studied population transfer. How quickly can I, in a transversal field, Hamiltonian, get population from the initial local minimum, the initial impurity state, to other impurity states as a subroutine for quantum optimization? And he found that it's possible to do this in Grover time, which I think suggests that the answer to your question is that of immediate intermediate power is yes. So when I saw these results, well, I was super happy. But then to um, Mohan's point, unfortunately, the resonances have to be exponentially sharp. So we can never build such an hmm. So in the noise-free case, I think it's powerful. But because we can build it into noisy real-world case. Yeah, I, I should mention one other thing, which is that one motivation behind these adiabatic algorithms is that people even think, OK, well, someday we'll have a fully fault tolerant universal quantum computer, and we could just take these adiabatic algorithms and simulate them using Trotter formulas and so on in a circuit model computer, and in that, case, in that way really, in some sense, implement a true, uh, essentially noise-free version of these algorithms. So you, as from like a sort of algorithmic or complexity theoretic point of view, um, you could just think of this adiabatic framework as just being some alternative design method for quantum algorithms that we then are interested in in the fault tolerant far future regime, the same regime where we think about Shor's algorithm and things like that. I think that has to be the final question before the break. The conclusion that you arrive at for the diffusion, uh, for the diffusion Monte Carlo system, is that generalized to all diffusion or just for your substochastic? Um, and uh, the second question is, what does it mean? It's in in between. At some point, you said it's in between. It's maybe not, but maybe it's partial. It, it, it wasn't yeah. clear what what you mean in between. Is it even MP complete or not MP complete? How can it be in between? Sure. So, um, so the first question um, <coughs> is, our counterexamples, do they apply just to our version of diffusion Monte Carlo or, or all diffusion Monte Carlo? And strictly speaking, our analysis was of our version of Monte Carlo. But um, it essentially, any process where you have a population of walkers, which is tracking this probability distribution, should be thwarted by these examples. Basically what happens is, in this probability distribution, the probability for a walker to be on some certain site at a certain time is exponentially small, and that site ends up being the site that has the global minimum later on. And so it's impossible in the sampling process to ever learn about the fact that there's this potential well there. So I really do believe that it's, it's quite generic to, uh, um, uh, to general Diffusion Monte Carlo uh, algorithms, but if you know if I'm speaking to a mathematician or something, then maybe I, I'm a little more careful. But basically, we believe that's the case. And um, so the second question is: is when uh, this possibility that 
Stochastic adiabatic computation is intermediate in power between classical and quantum computation. What do I mean by that? So in, in complexity theoretic language, what I would say is you have a set of problems that are solvable in polynomial time by classical computers. That's P. You have a set of problems that's solvable in polynomial time by quantum computers. That's BQP. And then you have what you might call stochastic P or something. And perhaps that's um, a set that's intermediate. It contains P, but um, it's strictly contained by BQP. That's sort of the, the conjecture, but we don't really know. Okay, let's thank our speaker, and actually let's thank all the speakers of this morning's session. <laughs> we will have uh, a 15 minute break, and we'll reconvene at 11. Oh, good. <laughs>